Welcome back to the Strength and Speed Podcast. I'm your host, Strength and Speed owner and Conquer the Gauntlet Pro, Evan Preparis. I get a guest with me on the line. Before we get to him, though, a quick word from our episode sponsor. This episode is brought to you by Elite Ops Energy Strips. Elite Ops Energy Strips are those dissolvable sublingual strips you put on your tongue, kind of like a minty flavor, and they also have 100 milligrams of caffeine. So if you're going to a race, great for a kind of a pre-race boost or you're going for a workout, pre-workout boost, or just kind of tired in the middle of the day. It's just a great product to have on on hand. They're super convenient, super small, so you can actually pack them and put them in your wallet or the back of your phone case, whatever whatever you want to carry them with you. And then if you're racing endurance and you don't want to buy gels and then caffeinated gels separately, you can just buy uncaffeinated gels and then have the Elite Ops Energy strips there also. So you can pick up some from EliteOpsEnergy.com and use code CTG10 for 10% off every order that's ctg10 and if you forget that you can head over to the ctg protein website and the codes on there and other sponsors in the discount section all right let's get to the guest joining me today i have christopher accord but you may know him better as beard or from battle frog so chris welcome hey how you doing so when uh, battle frog finally went under chris was the assistant uh, chief operating officer is that correct yes right on so this episode, we're going to be talking about Battlefrog, kind of the history of Battlefrog, and you know what kind of happened with that whole thing. You know, we we as athletes absolutely love Battlefrog. It's you know it's still talked about as in like such an epic race series, and you know I think some people are still looking for that feeling that we had for those couple of years. And then on top of that, we're going to talk about you know with the whole COVID crisis and pandemic. I think the OCR industry is about to go through a pretty radical transformation in the next year and a half. Um, so I'm going to kind of compare some of the things Battlefrog went through and see if we can see any impending warning signs or, you know, maybe things, you know, if we don't, if we don't look at our history, we can't learn from it and avoid similar mistakes in the future. So I'm going to kind of look at that. And then finally, end the episode talking about Amy Winters, who Chris is currently engaged to, and she's a below the knee amputee amazing endurance athlete right i mean like you know does well compared to people with two fully functional limbs has i believe a treadmill world record she just set and some other pretty amazing stuff all right so chris let's start at the beginning you know take us through where battle frog started and kind of when you came into the scene okay uh i want to say battle frog started in in uh 2014 time frame um I somehow got and I, or I saw that they were, were coming up as a, a new race and I wanted to try it out and, and ended up getting comped a couple of races because of my uh, just racing background. And I ended up going down to their second race, which was in uh, South Carolina. And then their third race, I think, through uh, Adrian Vigianata. Um He asked me to come up and, and run the one at... Um, it was a West Virginia race. And so after those two races, um, or maybe South Carolina was, and Atlanta was their first race, West Virginia was their second race, and South Carolina was their third race. So I ended up going down to the third race with my kids. Um, also got competent entry into that. And then after that, I had I've been asked to, uh, to sort of intern interview at, at their fourth race and came on board for that one. Right on. Now, I remember – if I remember correctly, the first couple of races had some pretty wild stuff on it. Like, you know, like kind of almost like a demonstration from Navy SEALs. Was that, is that correct? Or am I just misremembering so, history? So yeah, the, the very first race they had down in Atlanta, um, I want to say it was a Georgia uh, horse park. Um, <clears throat> to my understanding, they were marking the course and, and kind of got off course and, and a, a really strong endurance racer, a buddy of mine, Chris uh, Call, he, apparently like was on his motorcycle throughout the race and his motorcycle break down he's carrying it and they're still building the race at like four o'clock in the morning on race day 
but they had like set up all these demonstrations and they had a helicopter flying in. And then one of the, the founding guys, um, was, I think he wanted to be called Rick. He was a Navy SEAL. And, and so he would dr actually dressed up like a Taliban and these guys would come and they'd, they'd repel out of a helicopter and chase him down and do a demonstration. And it was amazing. Wow. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. Sorry. I missed those days. I didn't get to do my first one until 2015 Cincinnati. Now, when yeah. you said you came on board end of 2014, you started interning. So for, fourth, fourth race, what I ended up doing is, is that 2013, my, my wife had passed away and 2014, I was heavy in the obstacle race and I was just done with the office, done with the, the, politics of everything and and just i i needed a break from everything so i took a break and just traveled around the country with my kids i did this big long two-week round trip where i had a bunch of states and all these sites and tahoe and everything else and i've got a uh, two young kids that are with me full time and my i think they're two and four at the time and so i'm just we're hiking the rockies or we're, we're going on trails in wyoming and and they're breaking the tree line and, and crawling in big crazy looking trees and and Tahoe and everything else and so we're just stopping and I get a call because I dropped a resume off with, with the Battlefall company uh, just to hear I, I want to get an obstacle racing what do you have to offer and there uh, a buddy of mine Adam Petchuk who was also a race director with Battlefrog uh, gave me a call up and says hey can you meet us in Pennsylvania and at the time I happened to be in Indiana and I was like sure so we just swung by and and me Chris Call and Adam Petchuk we spent the next three days um uh, on quads and, and side by sides, just mapping all the trails with the GPS up at the uh, uh, Mines and Meadows, Pennsylvania, and and that's where we we come up with the concept and the design for the Mines and Meadow race course. And so um, my interning or interview was the those two days with those two guys just kind of hanging out up there and coming up with a course design. And and so once we came up with a course design. Chris Call was kind of stepping away from it. And Adam's like, yeah, we want to bring Chris on board. And, and that's how I got involved in obstacle racing. And it turned out that race ended up being ranked by Mud Run Guide, the number three race of the year, just behind Spartan World Championships and OCR World Championships. Yeah, that's the one That's the one in Pennsylvania that goes through the mine. Like, I actually go into a mine at one point, and it's, like, super dark. Is that correct? Correct. And we yeah. – so we lined the whole course in the mines with, with uh, glow sticks and, and actually had a – a uh, 300 meter swim um, underground in the dark, lit up by glow sticks. Yeah, I remember hearing stories. I mean, there's I know some pretty brave obstacle course racers that don't like being in the dark in water, and were kind of freaked <laughs> out by that. So, yeah, I, I never got to do that one, but that sounds like such an amazing course. Now, I I had never heard of. I mean, I just got into obstacle course racing at the end of 2014. And in 2015, I remember it's, the season started, and it seemed like everyone was talking about Battle Frog. So, take us through kind of how that started ramping up in, in 2015. Like I know that's when I think you signed, uh, you know, the pro team with Ryan Atkins, Corinna Coffin, and Marco and Claude. Yeah. So, so the the history of that there's uh, <clears throat> Leopoldo, and I forget his last name. He was we had a backer, and that backer. Uh, had a couple of attorneys and some some friends that were Navy SEALs and things like that. And he was an ex-Marine and he used to work for Johnson & Johnson and then kind of took what he learned from Johnson & Johnson and he bought a pizza joint and, and learned everything he could about pizza in Spain and then and <clears throat> ended up buying another and another. And he, he basically turned the company that he owned, Telepizza, into like the Domino's of Spain. Um, and over time ended up selling that for like $300 million where he took that investment and he took like an, uh, a downhill run of the mill telecommunications company. Um, and I forgot the name of it, but it was basically like a next tell or something, something that's kind of phasing itself out and he turned it into like an AT&T or Verizon and ended up selling that for 4.3 billion. But he also like Oof. had a passion for for horse racing but the 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 horses that he bred lost money and he also sold falcon eggs and falconeering is a huge industry in, in europe and asia and, and so those things kind of offset each other and and somehow he got had the right group of people around him to where he started this company and the obstacle racing and he wanted to turn it into something great um so that's how the the backing story came about so he had 
we had the funds behind it. We just needed to capitalize on the idea. And so when I came on the board, Battlefrog was blowing tons of money. Um, and I think when they brought me on to salary, I went from being a contract worker to, um, I think one of the races, they were spending close to six, $700,000 a race. Um, and me, I'm a, I used to run nuclear reactors. I was in the military and I got out and I was a, a, a modernization engineer for a, a weapons manufacturing. And at one point I was a deputy director of advanced rocket programs, helped turning um, those 70 millimeter hydro rockets that fly off of helicopters into smart rockets. Um, nice. So my whole background is project management professional and, and engineering and um, sort of like CAD drawings and things like that. So um, they had already started to have problems and they did a turnover because their spending was outrageous. Their build times were too long. They had a lot of waste. Um, and this is around that same time they were changing their race format from the, the 15K and the 5K to uh, the, the two lap 8K. And I think that first race is something I had to, in two days, come up with a design for. And that's where the, the Houston race um, with the crazy obstacles and the, the mud and everything else came about and the, the two lap format for the elites and the, um, so anyway, I digress, but, yeah. um, so like, as they're going through this turnover, I'm coming on board at the same time. And I just happen to have these skills, uh, that come into play. And at the same time, we're hiring build directors that are retiring from the military that can use Google SketchUp to, to revamp how we're loading everything. So there, there's tons of inefficiency there. And, and, and so over time, we ended up bringing the cost of the race down from, uh, I want to say 600000 down to 150000 um, And that's with all the overheads fully loaded into the race. So everybody's salary from the company is divided among the, the races and then, then put into there. Um, and on top of that, we, like I'm teaching, we, we, brought in Microsoft projects. So I'm teaching all the, as I moved up the chain, teaching all the, the event directors how to use Microsoft project to actually plan in advance when their build time is going to end and how many man hours and what the cost of the man hours are going to be. And so we were able to cut our crew down almost to a third, cut the rental equipment down from like 19 gators down to five. Um, and the telescoping handlers from, from like four down to two. And so the equipment costs, the build costs, and, and with that, and then the, the guys that we brought in from the military um, to use Google SketchUp to, to come up with a load plan, we were able to minimize and, and almost create kits that allowed for a faster build time. So we could literally drop something off, um, on a, show up on a Tuesday, start to unload Tuesday night, Wednesday start the build, uh, with the rest of the offload Thursday, be finished by five o'clock on Friday, wow. um, have our safety inspection, have the race on Saturday, start tearing down Saturday and Sunday and have everything loaded back up on Monday and shipped out to the next city. So that allowed, that allowed us with one kit, um, it ended up being like two box trucks and three flatbeds, um, to build a 35, uh, obstacle course in one week within a reasonable range of each other. And we could do that back to back to back to back to back. That's wild. Now, yes. I'm going to back up a little. You said you, they sw you switched to a two-lap format. What's kind of interesting is Tough Mudder tried to do that a couple, like two years ago, and people hated it. They were like so angry. But with, the weird thing was with Battle Frog, I remember loving it. Like I thought it was great. Um, I don't know. Just maybe your obstacle density and quality of obstacles was better. I, I'm not sure – Part of that, so there's a there's an art actually to race design, um, and wherever the location is, once you, and the way I kind of did it is, as I'd show up on a course, and whatever the property had, I would map every trail, every single trail, it didn't matter if it's 50 miles or 30 miles, on foot with a GPS, I'm mapping everything, and then so you'll I waypoint things that are nice to see, um, and whether it's, um whether it's a, a cool rock formation or a cool hill or, or a cool something else. So I ended up, 
creating the course from the natural land features that were there. And you were able to design everything else around that because you need certain footprints for your obstacles. And, and that, that kind of played itself out. And there's a, there's actually, me personally, I calculated mathematical functions of how many people would arrive at an obstacle at a certain amount of time and using a bell curve of how many people, whether you'd have bottlenecks or not. And um, so everything kind of worked itself out. And that's how the things progressed from just the run of the mill um, decide what you're going to do obstacle course, if that makes yeah. any sense. No, it does. And I love that you're breaking a bat breaking down a lot more of the details, you know, cause I think a lot of athletes show up and like, Oh, I show the build crew shows up, they throw some obstacles out, they mark some trails and done, you're done. Right. Like you don't even, you, this can't cost that much money. You know, companies must be raking in money at every event and. Exactly. You know. But there's so much more to it. And, yeah. and depending, you've got a certain throughput on the obstacles and you've got a certain width that you have to have um, for clearance. And, and like I had broken down and have videos still of, every obstacle that battle battle frog had and the average completion time for the elites and non elites. Nice. And I could tell you like, depending on, on for every mile in the course, 67% of a seven minute per mile average group will show up there within a three minute window. Hmm. Interesting. Now in 2000, so I believe in 2015 and you can correct me if you actually remember the numbers, I want to say you guys had about like, 12 to 15 events and then, i think it was right around 15 yeah okay and then in 2016 it went to like 36 or something i don't remember you remember the exact number i think we were aiming for 40 uh was the goal and yeah. i think we were on track ish to, to hit that with with a couple like you can't account for weather and things like that that causes us to cancel events but right so you know that is a enormous increase um i guess take us through the logic behind that because you know people like to sit back on the sidelines and sharpshoot um you know take us through the logic of making that huge jump from 16 to 40 and kind of how it played out so, and yeah so the one thing that we the way obstacle racing works is, is generally it, they have the same marketing model as a tesla or something like that so you have to have slow organic grassroots growth um, but Battle Frog had the backing to kind of do a faster growth uh, to that extent. But a lot of the numbers they were given in the beginning by the staff that they had were inflated and they were arbitrary. And it's almost like it, in any statistical model, you can, you can make it say whatever you want it to say 90% of the time using the right data. And, and that just wasn't the reality of the situation. And so they were lacking that slow organic growth and they were trying to shortcut that by either slamming a bunch of money into a street team or, or hiring a marketing company whose realm is to do marketing for major products, whether it's, it's sales, but they couldn't quite grasp how that sales translated into the, the marketing model and obstacle racing. And so that's one of the downfalls that they had uh, towards the beginning. And, and every six months, rather than let a, a strategy kind of take hold and, and, and root and, and grow from there, they instead would, well, this isn't working, let's change our strategy. Well, that isn't working, let's change our strategy. There's a couple of things that actually did well, and it, like the, the Fiesta Bowl and the ESPN show, our, our viewership was phenomenal. I mean, we're on par with a, what a, a Fox News or a CNN or, or ESPN gets nowadays. And so I think our, our second ESPN show had like 4 million viewers uh, per episode. What's wild and about so, that is, so, you know, a lot of people I work with have, don't really know anything about obstacle course racing, but for years after that aired, people were like, oh, like Battle Frog. And I was like, how did you still know about that? <laughs> you know, they remembered it for like literally years. It was wild. Um, and then I was like, oh yeah, yeah they, went on, they went under in like 2016. And they were like, really? I was like, yeah. So. And I, I still have people that, that, don't know that it closed up shop so the what battle frog was able to crack into was the the major media market where the the hard charge races and things like that weren't able to capitalize on. and so they had the connections to be able to make those things work and and so our our slow organic growth and to me what lacks in obstacle racing is the the planet fitness model right so we have the the gold's gym and we have the, the lifetime fitness 
uh, of the the obstacle racing with with Spartan Race and Tough Mudder and and now that they're combined, but that's a whole different right. <laughs> aside. And I, I'm sure we'll get to that later in the show. But um, Battle Frog was that what I was noticing. They were shifting towards that with their three tiered, uh, easy, medium, hard lanes and things like that. Um, which I they love. were shifting towards that planet fitness model um, mm. and being able to capture more of the, the, the masses with that. Gotcha. So uh, were a lot of your employees salary based? Um, is that why you went to essentially races every weekend? Because if you're paying people a salary and they're not physically doing work, you, you lose money or was it, um, I don't know, I guess just take me through. So, me so, through. so in the, in the beginning, the, the original people, they had the inflated, idea of they would get this many racers and make this much money every race and this is what they would spend and blah 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 so they they spent like crazy and their salaries were enormous so gotcha one by one over time uh, a, a ceo was replaced and he was no longer the ceo was no longer getting 300 grand a race and uh, a marketing manager who was getting 175 was no longer getting that you know so they were getting more reasonable salaries based on a brand new company trying to make the turnover. So the salary basis actually came down um, and streamlined. So the efficient inefficiencies were, were noticed. And so we had two or three media people and we had uh, a volunteer coordinator for each crew. And then we had two to three build directors who eventually became event directors and event directors kind of pared themselves down. The number of race, race directors went away and, and so we had a, a COO who ran half the races and a, a assistant COO, which was me, who ran the other half. And it ended up some of us were overlapping um, at every race because of the skill set, but we're salary, so we're not going to get paid anymore. We'll just add a location. Mm-hmm. Um, so that kind of worked. And, and so the, the only real crews that you had to hire were the uh, – the race day staff that you may or may not need to supplement and whether that's the, the trash people and the, the urinal cleaners and things like that on race day and the, the build crews were independent contractors and everybody else was a salary because they were working five to seven days a week. Gotcha. Yeah. I mean, so I ended up going to, I think four battle frog events in 2016 and it was, I mean, I don't know. I just have such fond memories of it. It was just such a good time. Now, I remember I was actually training. I was supposed to go to Battle Frog Cincinnati 2016, but I was training in California that weekend, so I wasn't available. And I remember yeah. waking up that some Monday morning and seeing like the announcements, like you know, Battle Frog's closed up shop. So take us through kind of how that uh, the final final fall went there. And 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 so that was kind of crazy. So we had the the ESPN show and and. I think we're in the process of either selling it or not. And the ESPN actually had the first right of refu- refusal for that. And then I think they were wanting to shop around to, to, to Disney or something. But the, with the viewership and everything, the idea was, well, we've got our foot in the door with ESPN. We've got the show. We can make so much more of an impact with just the show. Um, and then I know, like, there's some rumors that the board directors were – they were smart guys and they were, they helped found the company, but their ideas on how to make the business model work were not quite there. And so we would slowly remove their decision-making process from the input from the race. And, and over time, the board of directors, they're like, they, they had very little input as into what the race was becoming. And we we're starting to become profitable actually. Um, and you had, um, a lot of capital assets that you could actually divide up the depreciation value over a certain number of years. Um, and other right, than so that you, marketing it, piece, you don't need to replace still, on the, the, those obstacle trussings you had that were, you know, you could take apart. Um, yeah. You know, you don't need to replace those every year. Those are, I'm sure those things last for, I mean, who knows how many, how many years. Yeah. Correct. Uh, I think obstacle companies still have them. Right. Uh, they're expensive. They've been bought they're, and sold. Yeah, they're expensive up front. Over. Yeah, but they last. Um, yeah. So the, I think the board, and, and here's my opinion, like we were just starting to make the move to where we're going to be a profitable company. And I, I know Tough Mudder took um, 
many years to become where they were solvent. Um, the same thing with Spartan when, when Reebok and all those companies started came on is, is when they started to become solvent and they had to bring down their, their uh, build costs as well. So a lot of the, the, the improvements we did at the obstacle industry trickled over to the other race groups, uh, if you say. And I, I, I can look at race builds today from different companies and still see my policies and procedures that I put into place kind of copied over to there from the, the training that we've done with our own staff, which is, it, it's good to see because the, the obstacle racing industry really needed that program management and methodology, the, the lean manufacturing aspect incorporated into it to become a successful industry. Um, because outside of that, don't, you're not going to be as profitable as a 5K or a 10K or a, or a marathon, which is little to no overhead. Right. And you can literally have a race every weekend because somebody's going to do it. Um, so with Battlefrog, I think the, the board of directors got bored with it. At, around the same time we were starting to become solvent in our marketing um, and our grassroots growth. Um, and that's where I think the, the downfall came. And I know there's some infighting between Battlefrog and Spartan and, and things like that, but like ultimately it didn't hurt anyone because one, it pushed each group to kind of up their game a little bit to, to bring in more uh, – more contestants and the uh, the unfortunate thing with battle frog is they just decided yeah we're done yeah we, we've got so many are the the diversity of the company or the owners and the backers between the the horse racing the falcon eggs and the restaurants and the 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 pizza steak and the telecommunications the the losses from the obstacle racing country were, or a company were were neither here nor there to them so it just didn't matter but with the other companies that fitness model was their passion and that's why they stuck around and that's why they continued to grow and and there was no quit in that and with Battlefrog, is more of well yeah this is just another hobby but i could take it or leave it gotcha so i mean from what it sounds like you're saying is basically they put a lot of money in up front and the investment had a slower return than they were expecting and then they basically lost interest is that yes. would that be accurate that's that's the feel that I got from it. Now there's yeah. probably more behind the scenes stuff that I I wasn't privy to, but but this is my view of of how Battlefrog kind of evolved. Gotcha. Now I remember when they closed shop, they said we're gonna keep the TV show, uh, but close all the races. And most of the people on at the, on the athlete side took that as like this is battle frog trying to save face and there's absolutely no intention to continue on with the TV show. So what so they still own the company name. Okay. And they still own the TV show and they sold all of their equipment. So they're no longer paying storage fees or anything. So in reality, the company's not gone, gone. It's just not doing anything. <laughs> gotcha. So you, you can't steal the name right now, basically. Correct. Interesting. You know, you mentioned a lot of the things you guys did, the TV show, you mentioned the Fiesta Bowl. And again, athletes, we just come up with our own theories on why things fail without any real understanding. So Fiesta Bowl, was that from your, from your uh, position, do you think that was a good investment? And uh, if, so if we would have let it run out? Yeah. Well, I think it was because it was a, it's a, one of those once in a lifetime opportunities because the way those bowl games work, you have long-term contracts with, with a company. And what had happened is, is one of the sponsors just kind of fell apart or wasn't able to meet their obligation. And they're like, we already had that existing relationship with ESPN because we had done the, the college series the year before in Florida. And they're like, Hey, do you guys want to sponsor the Fiesta Bowl? We'll get, we'll, we'll allow you to sponsor it for cheap. So those long-term contracts and those long-term investments and that high dollar value wasn't there. So we actually got a great deal on a product and were able to kind of capitalize and, and help the show there with, with little, little to no investment because it, the opportunity just kind of fell into our lap. Gotcha. Are you allowed to disclose how much it was or is that you, you prefer uh, not to? No, <laughs> and I can't remember the exact value. I okay. mean, 
but but it was significantly less than a normal sponsor would pay for a, a, a bowl game. Okay, but I mean, it sounds like from the some of these numbers you threw out about salaries earlier and how much it was costing to build the events. I mean, it sounds like it was not a big quantity of money. Yeah, I remember like I remember watching you guys. I mean, like they're giving away a million dollars in prize money, and people we lost our minds. Right, we're like a million dollars. But it sounds like, you know, it sounds like you guys had very, very deep pockets where it was like, eh, that's not a big deal. We'll get it back. And, you know, people signing up for races and wanting to win. And, you know, even they, you guys are paying out, like, I think it was like 10 deep on some of the elite waves. At, at yeah. Those. And that's what it was. But you were looking at like the 10th prize is only getting a hundred bucks or something like that. Right. But if you have enough races and enough prizes, of course, there's going to be, it's, it's going to look like a big prize. So that a million dollars when you divide it up is not quite as great when you're doing it week after week after week and at the same time it was meant to to capitalize and and so there was some of the the beauty with battle frog is the everyday racer could come out still price and still win prize money now granted we actually had a team that would show up at every race and usually knock out the the top one two and three spots but right. seven through ten, you still had that opportunity to win prize money. And that's something no other industry out no other company out there offered at the time. Yeah. One of the other things people like to criticize Battle Frog for is the obstacles were too hard. It scared people away. So what what's your opinion on, on that? Well, and that's kind of why we evolved to the the three tiered series. And and in the beginning, the obstacles being harder actually allowed for the the not so tough. So you had you had races set up in, a, in such a way to where you had the same people winning over and over again, but, but somebody from Spartan couldn't generally, if they were a, a top Spartan athlete, couldn't come to a battle frog race because there was a mandatory completion aspect to it and the obstacles were harder. So I'd see guys that would win consistently top three at Spartan show up and not even finish a battle frog race, which allowed the everyday Joe who was more into the training for the specific aspect of it show up and and be able to play and and so that was that was the difference it allowed a, a, an average joe athlete to show up and become a, a top tiered name and have more of a social media presence because they were able to beat these bigger names from other race companies at the time and and so that's that model is great when you're low uh numbers and the throughput and there, you can allow people to stay on the obstacles all day. But once you start reaching those six, 7,000 uh, participants like we had in our Miami races, then you have to, to, to ease up a little bit on the, the obstacles. Gotcha. And also at the same time, as these obstacles are showing up on the market, the, the top people that are racing these week after week after week for these mandatory completions, and it, it's leading directly into the, the bigger prize races with the Obstacle Racing World Championships and the Spartan World Championships, um these guys are um getting practice at these obstacles and they're they're just getting that much more ahead of the competition whether they're qualifying through a savage race or qualifying through a a, a hard charge or something and, and those aspects so it gave kind of a leg up to, to some of the people that are able to race those races and then at the end of the season win the big prize money well you know, I, I love the the whole battle frog, the difficulty level. And, you know, our, the Conquer the Gauntlet team is all made up of people who used to do well at battle frog. Like, that's where we pulled all our athletes from. So, <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's funny you mentioned that the athletes practicing. We've seen the same thing at Conquer the Gauntlet where, you know, they, 2018, the first race of the season, they introduced this like floating board uh, over water on one of their rigs. And then, you know, like, no one can get across you know barely, barely anyone gets across that race and the next race everyone's just flying through it like it was nothing because like everyone's like oh okay that's what we're doing now and they all went home and practiced and they all come back and it's like you know the 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 improvement curve was just so rapid uh that year with people you know training specifically for uh, what they were seeing on course absolutely cool yeah i think that clears up a lot of misconceptions because people um again people you know, we, we see something and we just assume, oh, well, that's why people aren't showing up or that's why uh, they went out of business. And, you know, I, I've said this before where, you know, I've sat, sat around at a Conquer the Gauntlet by the rope climb, giving people tips. And like most of the open way people can't do a single, like a simple rope climb. 
something that we would Correct. consider very easy, right? It's not even, it's not even listed as like an, like a challenging obstacle. Um, and most of them don't care, to be honest with you. Most of them are like, eh, whatever. You know, I think the, hey. the percentage of people who really care about keeping the band and keep doing every obstacle is, is actually pretty small. Um, they're vocal because they're the ones who are following Motor and Guide and the other uh, obstacle course racing websites. But um, I think the percentage is small when it comes to the total number of people coming to a race. That is spot on. And if um, I actually wrote a couple of articles for Adventury, the OCR World Championships, about obstacle difficulty, and I think I cover it pretty well. Um, basically, a lot of people say they want challenges. They want, but what they mean is I want something that's challenging as like as hard as it can be for me and I can still pass it. That's what they really mean. And and that's exactly mean. what, so everybody wants to be able to complete everything. Yeah. Like, and, and so me personally, like I gear for a 70% completion rate of the, what, what the so-called elite wave, because not everybody's elite, first of all, um, or a professional racer or, or any of that. So you have that, the, the people that just want to sign up to say they were running elite. And so in my head, that takes out that 30%. And um, with me being on the lower edge of an elite racer, if I can do the obstacle after working a, a full day of work and not running the entire course, if I can do that obstacle as a standalone, it should be able to be completed by 70 to 80% of elite racers. Gotcha. I know. I think the main prizes do something similar, but Dave and Steve are both freakishly strong. Where they'll be like, "Oh, that was that's a super easy obstacle," and then I'll fin I'll do it on the course, and I'll be like, "It's not super easy. I was exhausted, <laughs> and I barely got across." Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So let's go, continue on. You know, 2016. You guys went out of uh, Battlefrog went out of business. Everyone was sad. Uh, we're still we're still mourning the loss, and. 2020 we're jumping forward now the ocr industry has basically been at a standstill for several months you know we're supposed to kick off most races kick off their season in um kind of early spring and basically with the covid restrictions there was no races and races starting to come back slowly but there's caps on event sizes and people are I'd say more hesitant to come out and actually race so i guess you know, from, from your foxhole there, you know, you've gone through with a company that folded, you know, what should we be concerned about or what, you know, kind of what's your opinion on this whole situation with uh, COVID going on? So uh, luckily I'm a very cerebral individual and I kind of pay attention to a lot of things globally on a, a global scale. Um, and so the, the smart thing to do, you, if, it from a business standpoint from any business like right now i work for uh, i run logistics uh, for a greater long island running club and they primarily are a, a non-profit group set up to put on races road races for different companies all over the long island area at the same time i'll, I'll consult with the, the city challenge race shout out to city challenge um and 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 see the things that are going on in the industry with the Spartan and death race and the Kogis and things like that. So one, it's part of the, the crew that you have as individuals. Uh, if you're a race company out there, you should have applied for the small business loan that was out there. Like if you were smart enough to do that, um, you should be in a good situation to be able to succeed in upcoming races. The, the flip side of that is, you should have already had your virtual race. Like virtual races are very low overhead. Um, it still keeps people engaged and, and going and, and you make a, a pretty decent profit off virtual races if you charge the right price for it. On top of that, you still want to have that lifestyle philosophy. And so a lot of companies out there now like, like Spartan are very well equipped to be able to weather the, the pandemic because they did the small business loan. Um, I'm pretty sure that they got it. Um, they also did a every day for 90 days, a warrior call every morning from people across the world. They were able to give a, an update on what's going on in their part of the world to keep people engaged and motivated and ready to go. And they have some really good hires. I know like, uh, Josue Stevens who runs their, 
uh, a gogi program. He also has the the Fuego Agua Racing Series, and he's a, a program manager by trade. So his races are are some of the top races on the planet, and that's what you need. You need individuals out there that are able, cerebral enough to to come up with a good game plan and incorporate the event in such a way to where it pulls in the local culture, it pulls in the local terrain. And, and when you have that kind of staff, you're going to create some of the best events on the planet. And it's more about the experience then and not so much of, of numbers. Um, and Spartans also position themselves in such a way to where they're Hey, we we just bought a La Ruta race, which um, Amy Winters was able to do that. It's a bike race across Costa Rica, and it's touted as the hardest bicycle race in the world. And I kid you not, stage one was like 34 miles or something like that, and and 12,000 foot of gain um, on a bike, and like it's straight up and straight down over and over and over again every day. So I think over the the course of the race, you end up climbing Everest twice on a bicycle. Um, so, but they, they're able to take that LaRuta model in the bike race and incorporate that under the Spartan umbrella. So the race is the same, it stays LaRuta, but they're able to acquire a race that adds to their, their breadth and the diversity of the race. So they truly are becoming a, a lifestyle company. And it's not just about the sprint, the super, the, the beast, the, ultra beast the uh, agogis and things like that now they have a bicycle race and they have spartan trail racing which kind of mimics the sky racing series that you see across europe um that that is, is big around the world so once you look into these different race genres and these ultras and everything else you find that they're acquiring different aspects of different races um and able to tap some of that market and so the diversity allows them to be set up well. And they just acquired the, I guess, the, the owning stake in Tough Mudder. Tough Mudder is still going to be Tough Mudder. Kyle's still going to be there to run Tough Mudder. But they're just going to fall under the Spartan umbrella, which allows Spartan and Tough Mudder to kind of remain in business for a while. Now, if the savage races of the world or the, the, the other different races, um, one, if you're on the smaller side, you're going to be fine because – it doesn't take that much overhead and that much cost to actually put on a race. But if you're a bigger race company and you needed to store a lot of materials and you needed to store to pay a lot of, of people or they're going to leave or go to another company, then you should have done the small business one. Um, so if you have the passion to want to be there, you're going to still be there. If you don't um, and you're just in it for a quick buck, then, then you go away. Okay. That's good. I'm, I'm glad, I'm glad you uh, put that information out there. I'm, I'm I'm fairly doom and gloom from some of this stuff and um some of my expectations are are pretty low <laughs> moving forward. <laughs> so I I like to hear a lot of the things you said. I think that was that was very informative. All right. Let's start wrapping things up. Before we go though, you know, we mentioned at the beginning of the podcast that you're engaged to El Amy Palmero winners and she's an incredible endurance athlete below the knee amputee. Um, I first saw her at World's Toughest Mudder 2014, which is my first World's Toughest. And I think she came in like eighth place or something like that. She, I know she was top 10, like, which is insane considering she's um, missing part of, her, part of her lower leg there. But she's also done some pretty incredible stuff, at least, you know, not only in the last couple of years, but even this year already. So can you tell us some of the stuff about her? You know, um, she's, she's just – she's the most humble, the most outgoing, the most giving person that I've ever met in the world. Um, and she's never actually looking out to do anything for herself. She just happens to love the, pa she has a passion for, for performing and, and pushing the limits of what she thinks is possible for herself. Um, what people don't know about her, is she has an ESPY award. She was the 2010 um, athlete uh, best athlete in the world that had uh, a disability. And she also won a Jay Sullivan's award that same year for, for best amateur athlete. Um, and she's got world records in 50 Ks. I think in a 24 hour period, she ran 130.04 miles. Um, and that's, a, that's a record. She was the only amputee on the able body team USA, uh, ultra team 
and she's got triathlon world championships. Um, she's got the, the world record in a, a sprint triathlon, a, a Ironman, a Ultraman, um, 50 Ks, 100 Ks, 50 milers, 100 milers. She, she ran a, a 18 hour, 100 miler and won it outright beat every male and every female <laughs> and every able-bodied every person. She's the first and I think only amputee to complete Western States um, endurance run. And she did that not because it wasn't even for herself. Uh, a guy wanted to become a first, he was an amputee, he wanted to be the first guy to do it. And he did it one year and failed. And he was running the next year and he actually had a, an accident where he's training in like a cement truck uh, the boom came loose on the back and, and swung out and killed him. So she ended up running that race, finishing it, and then took the belt buckle to his family and gave, presented them with the buckle. Wow. So everything she does, she kind of does for a purpose because if it can help just one person be a better version of themselves, she does. And, and here recently, like in March 1st, we ran the, the USATF um, – 50 K road championships. And she actually broke her world record from 12 years ago um, by almost an hour while carrying a 15 pound pack. Cause we're, we're training for, for marathon to sob. Um, last year she became the first female MPT to complete marathon to sob in the Sahara desert, which is a, a seven day self-supported um, carry all your food um, race that, that takes place over seven days in the Sahara desert over 150 miles. And we're actually supposed to go back in September to, to run this race again. And um, it's going to be part of a, a Netflix show um, where we can't name the, the show yet. Nice. So, so we were training for that, but like she's such an amazing individual that she doesn't set out to do anything great. She just wants to push the envelope of what she can do. And so she, 10 years ago when she was running all these, um, training for all these ultras she she would train through the night on treadmills and things like that and just run non-stop to get ready for the, the ultra championships um in europe and things like that and she'd see different people running nowadays on treadmill and setting these treadmill records and she's like you know what i can do that um so we're actually in the talks with guinness right now on how do we uh, how do they accept her her treadmill records and things like that so we went up to to and coordinated with Joe and they went and picked up a, a treadmill from a local gym up there. And so we just ran for 24 hours to see how well she could do it. And she ran a hundred miles and, and that was the goal to run a hundred miles in under 24 hours. She did in 20, 21 hours and change. Um, and actually for her running on a treadmill was harder than running on a, a trail because of the, the, the constant pounding from the machine. It, it, it has a certain cadence to it that, over time, we'll, we'll send a, a shock up your leg and into your, your residual limb, mm. um, the, the end of it and things like that. So th there's so much, so many dynamics that go into to prosthetics. And, and what people don't understand is like when she does a race like Marathon de Saab, it'd be the equivalent of us walking 150 miles with one foot on the curb and one foot on the road. Because you, you don't have a single prosthetic that will mimic a different stride length so if you're set up for one stride length and one speed if you are slower oh, yeah. or faster than that everything's off and and a leg uh, a hard fixed leg and, and prosthetic um, spring on the, the bottom of the, the or prosthetic foot um, those curve shapes they don't they can't adapt to the changes in terrain and the changes in pitch of elevation and things like that like our normal leg would. Um, so unless you're carrying 17 legs with you out on the course, you're pretty much screwed or locked into one or two. And, and the changes in terrain, it, it takes its toll on the limb itself. And so she has a unique ability to, to block out all that pain and just put it out of her head. But she did a death race last year where she crawled seven and a half miles under barbed wire. And the only person that beat her was a guy from Canada so in a 12 hour period, no woman and no amputee has crawled farther than she has. And, but as a result of that, she got her, her, her calf on her sound leg has not been able to fire yet. She's still able to go out and, and set these world records just by sheer grit. 
and that's just the beauty of her. She she just pushes through everything. That that's amazing. Yeah, I said before we started recording the podcast, I was like, I just want to talk about her a little bit because she really deserves her own full episode uh, where we dive into a lot of her training and all the things she's done. And you know, I I know a fair amount about her, but I did not all know all of those. That is that's even more impressive than I was tracking. You know, I, and you could we'll definitely get her onto a podcast because there's so many cool stories about our our first date and how we met at death race, um, 54 hours in coming out of a river and, and everything else. So. Awesome. Yeah. We'll definitely get that scheduled for, for later on this year. All right. I think that's going to start wrapping things up. Um, I know Chris, you still t- have a couple touch points within the OCR industry. So, you know, where can people find you now that, you know, you're you know, basically only doing part-time stuff in the OCR industry? You know what? They can. I, I'm still on obstacle racing. You'll you'll find me at most city challenge races. Um, it's literally LV Guzman as the owner of that race, and he he lives less than 25 miles away. So most city challenges, I'm either there with a or, or my footprints on it with a design or something like that. But it, it, <clears throat> if you'll come to one of those events, I'll I'll be there. Every once in a while, you'll you'll catch me uh, doing something with Mud Run Guy because Brett. Um, Brett Stewart has a company and he'll, he'll get some contracts here and there where he puts on some fundraising events. Um, to be, to be honest, if you just find me on Instagram or Facebook and, or, or give me a, a shout, um, and a, you're in the new England area, I could probably, uh, you'll probably see me at one of those races. Yeah. I went to my first city challenge race last year and you were there and you said hi to me. <laughs> and I was like, who is this man talking to me? Because your beard was gone. So it made it very hard for you, me to recognize you. I was very confused. <laughs> <laughs> like I was just staring at you like an idiot for like 10 seconds. And you're like, it's Chris. I was like, oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, I, I know, now I know who you are. I'm good. But um, It's so much better not having a long beard uh, to soak up all the dirt. Yeah, just a heads up for anyone who's on the, who's on the lookout for you. So it's a, it's a different, different look, definitely. Absolutely. Well, Chris, again, thanks for coming on and thanks for giving everyone a whole bunch of good memories with Battlefrog, both back then and then bringing us back and telling us a little bit more about behind the scenes type stuff uh, that we missed because we were focused on running in circles. So yeah, it was a pleasure to be on. All right. We were, we're going to take off any final shout outs you want to give friends, family, sponsors, companies, uh, et cetera. You know what? I just, I, t- to be honest, I, I, I want to capitalize on a, one of the things that we say so amy does a show where we participate every week and we're able to uh on the grindhouse radio put out a a, a, we call them leading women or leading ladies so every couple weeks we do a a leading ladies episode um so i want to give a shout out to to really the ground grindhouse radio and, and give that a listen but the way we sign off each one of those uh the leading ladies is is um, remember the next decision that you make could be the one that changes your life. Um, and le- that's what I'd like to remind all the viewers out there. You're only one decision away from a completely different life. So go out and do something amazing. Awesome. And for our listeners, you can head over to teamstrengthspeed.com. Uh, my books are available on the website. So I've got hard copies of five of my books and I just released a digital only copy of Conquer the Gauntlet Pro Team OCR Workouts to Go. So it's basically a list of 75 plus workouts you can download via Amazon and it's basically like a pocket guide. So, you know, as you're traveling and going to races or, you know, I go on a lot of business trips for work, you always have a list of workouts you can do. And a lot of it's broken down by, you know, what type of equipment you have. So if you're in like a regular gym or if you have access to a playground or an OCR gym, or maybe it's just a treadmill. So a hotel gym, so kind of like minimal equipment type stuff where you can still get a good OCR focused training session in. A lot of times they're heavy grip focused. The running ones are broken down into lactic threshold and VO2 max workouts. And then other than that, uh, final reminder, my audiobook Ultra OCR Man from Special Forces Soldier to Record Setting Obstacle Course Racer is available on digital, hard copy, and now Audible. So if you have any Audible credits, you can head over and download that. Much appreciated. And uh, yeah. That's about it. Hoping things get back to normal pretty soon. I know races have started up again in the Midwest, kind of the smaller ones. 
And, you know, we had KC Timber Challenge, Dauntless Primal Assault, Ridge Run up in Iowa. So a couple little ones here and there. And Spartan did their first one a little while ago. So we'll, uh, we'll see how the season plays out. And, yeah, look forward to seeing everyone back on the course. And, Chris, I'll have to say hi next time I'm up uh, visiting my family because you're, like, 15 minutes away from my parents' house. So <laughs> Sounds good. All right. We'll catch you later. All right. Take it easy, Evan.